Hi, everybody. You guys hear me well? While you're uh, grabbing your last bite? Uh, it's actually a talk about building communities <coughs> to form trust between us. And there's no, way, no better way of building communities than sitting down and eating together. Uh, I'm going to focus on a piece of technology called, called Zero Knowledge Proof. And how can you start trusting this new advanced technology when most people here probably don't know how this technology works uh, deeply. So how can you start trusting putting some technology in your systems when you don't know how it works? Uh, it starts with, uh, with what we're all engaged here uh, with. It's the expansion of blockchain to many new use cases. We're beginning to see blockchain in places where it's not about sharing the data with everybody and notarizing the data. It's not about transparency anymore. You cannot allow other people to see all the data anymore in those new use cases. For example, when you're moving financial assets, it's not OK for everybody in the network to know what everybody else was doing. So you need to start thinking about privacy. You need to start thinking about what's in the blocks. What are you going to show to the others? Another use case, supply chain management. If I'm a supplier, I don't want the other suppliers to know exactly what I did and when. So it's no longer OK to be kumbaya. Blockchain is a transparency machine. Everybody can see everybody else. That doesn't work. <laughs> That's the kumbaya guy, I guess. Thanks. Um, the third uh, use case that we see on, uh, on fraud detection exemplifies things that you can do now that you couldn't do before. Collaborating with your competitors to fight fraud in insurance, for example. So all these use cases, you cannot share your private data with all the other parties. So you have a privacy problem for applying blockchain. And the big problem is there's no satisfying solutions out there right now. There's something called Intel SGX, which you probably heard of. This is taking your chip and dedicating a part of the chip to doing calculations that are out of reach for you. So Intel is signing all those calculations and in an encrypted form. So you're trusting that hardware is functioning correctly. It's kind of a closed source and black box approach, but it provides you privacy. Uh, it's structurally problematic. You're going to trust Intel, and there's nothing to do about it. Another approach to solving the privacy problem, uh, what we call circles of trust, or channels for Hyperledger. There's other names. This is selectively sharing the data with some participants, still encrypting the data and putting it in the blocks, but choosing who can see it. This is uh, limiting the problem, but when one circle of trust needs to be saying something to another circle of trust, you're back to the, back to the same problem. You cannot share the data between those two circles of trust, and so you have a privacy problem again. And some other uh, solutions involve altogether foregoing consensus or introducing a central party again that sees the data and says who has access, who can see what. So just taking trade-offs on the entire distributed approach. So these are all sort of dead ends that have structural problems. There's a technology now that I'm focusing on in this talk, zero knowledge proofs, where there is still uh, you know, trade-offs that you're taking. So scaling, and it's a complex technology. But those are going to be solved. And there's people working on, on those problems to solve all of them. 
there's a move in the industry on betting on zero-knowledge proof to solve the privacy problem of blockchain. And there's already two uh, existing and, and, and many more in, in the works uh, approaches and, and offerings that go to developers. So you've all heard about Zcash. Uh, Zcash is uh, focused on cryptocurrency. They set a very high standard on the quality of the engineering of their solutions. So this is zero knowledge proof applied to uh, cryptocurrency moving around. But if you expand the use cases to the enterprise world, so that's Kedit, that's the company, I'm a CEO and co-founder of that company. When you expand the use cases there, you can take from the use case trade-offs that don't exist in cryptocurrency and have better scaling, have easier deployability of zero-knowledge proofs. Those are already on the market. But so, so this, is a, this approach doesn't have the structural problems of, uh, let's say, SGX or circle of, of trust. But there's another problem that's fundamental to zero knowledge proof is that how can people trust this technology when they basically don't understand it? So this is like a, an anti-show of hands, I, I presume. Can, uh, who here knows how zero knowledge proofs fully work? Who, who can describe? When I say fully, those who l read the papers are smiling because they know kind of how it works. The papers are complex. Fully work, there's very little people even in the academic world that, that will go and say, yeah, I know how it fully works. Because it's so many levels of complexity, uh, this technology. And, and I will touch a little bit on it. So how can you deploy this technology if you, if you don't know how it works? Your team probably has problems understanding in details how it works. And you, you're not even sure what is the process for you to gain trust in this technology. How, how can you approach zero knowledge proof and start trusting it if nobody on your team really understands how it functions? So this is a, this is a real problem to sell solutions you know, in, the, in the enterprise world. If, uh, if the clients have a problem even assessing what you're selling. The way we approach it is to uh, progress, start from the fundamental place where zero-knowledge proof acquires its uh, strength. Zero-knowledge proof is based on mathematics. It's cryptography that proves that you cannot share things, that you can prove things on data but the other side will not have access to the data. So you, you can, for example, uh, prove your credit score based on all your financial transactions. That's a, an application, right? You can prove all your, your credit score, the calculation on your financial data without having to reveal that financial data. It separates the information, the data, from the proof of the, the claim that you're trying to claim. So to make it a little bit clearer, I'll give the, you know, the canonical example of what is the zero knowledge proof. So my five-year-old uh, back home got a Where's Waldo book and was trying to look for Waldo, but she got very frustrated. She couldn't find Waldo on the, on the page. And she didn't stop believing me, stop trusting me that there's actually a Waldo on the page. So I cannot come and show her Here's Waldo because that ruins the fun, and I want her to, uh, you know, to, to search. But she doesn't trust me. So how do I prove to her that Waldo is here without sharing the information of where Waldo is on the page? What I did was take a large envelope, four times the size of the book, place a small hole in the middle of the envelope, and place the open book of Waldo inside the envelope. I know where Waldo is. so I. I placed Waldo right under this little hole, and I showed her that Waldo's on the page, but the rest of the envelope is blocking the context. So now she has the proof that Waldo's there, but now I'm gonna shake the envelope and hand it over to her. So she gets an envelope with an op open book inside that I obviously didn't replace because it was, 
you know, inside the envelope. And she knows that Waldo's there because she saw Waldo pe peeking under the, the hole. So she has the proof, but she doesn't have the information that goes to prove the proof. And actually, this is exactly the steps of a zero-knowledge proof protocol. Showing without context to generate, to, to prove some fact, and then shaking, this is adding randomness. This is done with cryptography. The first part is information theoretical, and the second part is cryptography to not be able to retrace where exactly is, uh, is Waldo. Those, those principles, you understand that you can probably prove them mathematically, but to go from there to do complex calculations, it requires a lot of steps. So the mathematicians, the academic researchers on the left, they're preoccupied with proving that you can prove statements, that you cannot retrieve the data, but in order to prove that, they take assumptions and they, their first goal is just to prove that it's mathematically right. The practical use of zero-knowledge proof comes later. There's a whole scientific community that takes over from the, the first inventions, the first discoveries of ways to do zero-knowledge proof. It's called zero-knowledge proof schemes. So every time there's a new scheme, there's a sort of branch where people take it and start to make it practical. It stops being this, just this thing that was just proven by academics, and it becomes more and more practical. And then engineers and developers take it further and actually build the libraries, the code, to, to implement those, uh, those schemes. So this is a whole trust ecosystem where you want to preserve the fact that this is mathematically proven. It's, uh, it's statements, statements that went through the whole peer review mechanism of the scientific community. And then from there went to practical applications, and you find them in the end in products uh, with uh, integrators. So how do, where, where do you make, do, do this pr uh, process of generating the peer review and, and having uh, the scientific community focus their effort on making it practical where it matters. How, where do you have these, uh, these conversations between industry and academia on, uh, on zero-knowledge proof schemes? And how do you still preserve the security and the, the properties of those schemes? So this happens. This is an effort that we initiated uh, along with Zcash. And there's many, many actors that join this effort. It's called zkproof.org, the standardization effort of zero-knowledge proof. Uh, this picture is from Berkeley a few weeks ago. I recognize some of the faces that were uh, uh, there with us. Uh, if you play the game, you can also find me, the Where's Waldo game here is, uh, yeah, well, the guy with the suit, uh, next to the other guy with the suit. Um, so what we did there is have this community, th this is a catalyst to have those conversations on peer reviewing the different schemes, verifying, selecting what schemes are ripe for standardization. But standardization is just this step in the way. The, the, the biggest effort is making sure that the industry can trust that this technology works and it works not because, not because it's Intel that made it or because you took a limitation. It works because the math works and the proofs uh, have been done correctly and were peer reviewed. So this is zkproof.org. Uh, I encourage you to, if you're interested in this field, there's many, many YouTube videos that describe each and every scheme that now exists in zero knowledge. In particular, one of these one of this uh, tree of uh, zero knowledge proof schemes is uh, based around uh, work from uh, Groth, Jens Groth, that spawned a whole practical set of tools and libraries that are now being standardized. And what we do at Kedit is implement zkproof.org. So in this way, we have all the way from the researchers 
to uh, providing it to integrators and developers, we, we can preserve the trust in the technology, why it works. So Kedit implements that. And if you're interested in uh, more in, in those products, of course, you can approach us. There's an, there's a, an event tomorrow evening uh, at 6 p.m. We're launching uh, you know, a product around asset transfer with zero knowledge proofs. And you're all warmly invited. I'm opening the, uh, the, the remaining time. So I kept the remaining time for questions. Uh, and if you don't have questions, I will, I will have a set of questions. Hey everyone, I have a mic right here. I can walk around. Oh, okay. So if you could just keep your hand raised. Okay. So there's a there's a sort of flyer that you can have here to understand uh, more about the event tomorrow, and you can book one-on-one -on -one slots to get more understanding on the technology itself. So I'm going to say something controversial, right? So part of my excitement about your product for about a year now has been that you don't need a blockchain for this, as in. You can deploy this uh, type of technology for enterprise applications inside a bank on a regular database system and still get a lot of value out of it, so you don't need to wait for blockchain. So uh, what sort of applications are you seeing uh, where, let's say, financial services clients can use this technology without having to use a blockchain? So uh, it's tr well, what we need from a blockchain is immutability of the transactions so that when you move an asset, everybody agrees on the previous state and the next state, but it's still zero knowledge proofs being generated at every uh, player. So if you can store those, uh, those proofs instead of on an immutable blockchain on some database that people sh uh, you know, trust that will remain there, that there's, you cannot uh, censor the database, then yes, you can have uh, these types of systems. Yeah, so the, uh, the, the proof of concept that you're coming out with, is that on a particular blockchain, or is it just an agnostic thing, or is it uh, just like in the ether, like, or, or how, how does that work? So the underlying blockchain that, uh, that this product runs on is, uh, we, we, we don't mind which blockchain it is. The first one that we integrated to were uh, Ethereum, Quorum, and uh, Ant Financial, and VMware. Those are actually partners uh, that, that partnered with Kedit to, uh, to have uh, Kedit uh, asset transfer as the, as the default way to move assets on those blockchain. But, but it's open to many more integrations, and we're talking with many more actors on integrating. So uh, and Financial, is, is, do they build their own, or uh, is it based on something already there? I'd rather not talk about what Ant Financial is doing uh, in public. Uh, what, it, what was announced, they have uh, blockchain as a service that now is being uh, sold to, to, to uh, many clients in China. And that blockchain as a service offering will have Kerit as a, as a default on, on the blockchain. But uh, more than that, I, I unfortunately cannot uh, disclose. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, could you go a little deeper into what aspects of zero knowledge proof needs to be standardized and perhaps give an example of a technology today that you see went through a similar process of standardization? Sure. Uh, I'll start with the second one. We actually invited uh, people from RSA that explained to, her, to us how they did the standardization of public key cryptography, you know, signatures, and certificates. This entire field in the 90s had several different uh, competing uh, possi possible uh, technologies. And it created a, a need to, you know, to concentrate all the efforts on one set of, uh, of, of technologies. So back in the 90s, public key cryptography was, was such an example. And today, it's a, it's a full-blown standard that has shown how important it is to concentrate these efforts. And that's, that's what it's about. It's interoperability between different companies so that we don't end up writing the same things and they're incom incompatible between them. So to give an example, uh, Zcash is using 
uh, on, on their sapling uh, blockchain. They're using cryptography called ZK Snark and a, a particular flavor of ZK Snark. Uh, we did some auditing of that technology uh, with them and, and for Zcash. And that is the basis of, uh, of uh, forming standard around asset transfers with zero knowledge proof. So has there been any thought towards um, having like a NIST competition kind of thing like with Shaw or like any of the other things for like a zero knowledge NIST standards or any of that? Or like how Actually much NIST, NIST yeah. has now joined the effort of ZK Proof. So NIST is part of zkproof.org. Today they advise the effort on how to, do, to give guide, guidelines to developers how to use the technology. It's not, not all of the schemes are ready for standards. But they're already explaining to us what is the process of gaining a, a standard status, specifically NIST. Hey there. Um, thank you for your talk again. Um, my question is very related to the one you answered a couple of questions ago, which is, Again, you started your talk and everything you said about things like not fully understanding the math and being a complicated cryptographic idea was true of public key cryptography. Yet presumably, although most people in this room maybe still fully don't understand the math behind something like that, we trust it. Do you think the only difference between something like public key cryptography and ZK proofs is that ZK proofs haven't gone through that standardization process or is there something fundama fundamentally enigmatic about zero knowledge proofs, do you think? So uh, it's an awesome question. So when uh, public key cryptography was, uh, was created, the need was huge. And it opened up the way to have you know, e-commerce. So the commercial applications were immediately there. And it's the same with, with zero knowledge proof. The, the possibility to collaborate with your competitors, that's a need that you see everywhere or based on, uh, you know, on private data. It's a need you see everywhere. So, so we immediately go and, and create those solutions. It's just that if all of us are going in different directions, uh, those solutions are going to end up fragmented. And we can already see uh, why we need to have a, a similar set of tools to, to standardize it. The effort to show that some library is uh, is secure and correctly implemented, it's a very big effort. So it should be you know, uh, uh, done with all the help that, uh, that the industry can, uh, can bring. 